be able to get the strength back into her legs, dear God, and that you would minister to her and to Gordon, dear God. And Lord, I pray also that you touch Sister B, Lord, and, and, and Russell, dear God. And I know it's a lot that she's dealing with and taking care of, but dear God, I know you're going to be with them and that you're helping them and giving her wisdom and decisions that they have to make and tests that are being taken, dear God. Lord, we pray, dear God, for caring. God, that you would touch and heal her body, dear God. We know that you are able to heal, dear God. We've seen you heal before. And you can take cancer and you can eliminate it before a doctor ever gets a hold of it, dear God. And we believe that you're able to do that for her. And God, I pray right now by your stripes that she will experience healing in the name of Jesus. God, we pray, dear Lord, that you would touch us in this place today. One, dear God, we want to praise you and lift you up, dear God. We want to honor you and magnify you, dear God, to, to God today. And we bless you, O oh Lord. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus, dear God, that you touch and minister to these precious folks. Lord, thank you, dear God, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And we turn this service over to you in Jesus' name. Would everybody say amen? amen. Why don't you clap your hands to the Lord and honor him this morning. favorite things to get to do in the kingdom because I know that God blesses us to be cheerful givers. And I love it to be able to be a cheerful giver. Now some people can people can kind of have a have a little sour face and, and they can they can have a have, have a have, have, brother Rigney used to say old cow face when people had that frowns on their face and they uh, you know but I, I don't want to have no cow face when I'm worshiping the Lord. I want to have a happy face. 
I want to do this cheerfully. And I thank God for the opportunity to get to do this. And so we're going to right now, we're going to bless the Lord with our tithe and with our offerings this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, that we can come and we can give cheerfully this morning. Dear God, that we can bring it to you right now, dear God, in excitement and thanks, dear God. And Lord, happy that we get to give to you because you've given us so much, dear Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, in Jesus' name. Would you worship the Lord with your gifts this morning?
And so right now, I'm going to ask Charles and Leah if they will bring, if they will bring baby Laura up here, and, and Ron, you can come with them too. Uh, you know, I've got a chance to know Ron what, about eight years now, seven years, six years, something like that, and, and, um, and, and never seen him change more than when he got to have a grandbaby, you know. <laughs> And he said, it, he, 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 I heard him say that if, if he knew grandkids would be as enjoyable as they are, he would have had them before he had his kids. That's right. All right, and that's what most people say. I want you now y'all see, they look at her. Isn't she smiling? She's just smiling at everybody. She wants everybody to take her. Now, y'all want y'all to get over here in the middle, and I want y'all to turn toward me. Back, um, I got to do um, their, their wedding um, and in this altar. And, and I remember getting to do their wedding in this altar, and, and um, which, my goodness, Leah, I've known you since you were a little kid, and, and taking her to church camps and things like that, and, and then getting the, for the privilege of being able to perform her and Charles' wedding, and um, it was a, was a privilege. But then they messaged me. They don't live here anymore. They live it's around Nashville, right? Jackson. In Jackson. So they, they, they live an hour and a half, almost two hours away, and, um, and they messaged me about being up here this weekend. They wanted to do baby dedication. I said, all right, I'm in. I'm glad to be able to do this. And so um, to get to do a baby dedication, 
of, of, of a precious child is a special thing, but also to get to do this for this family is special. You know, the famous preacher, one of the great preachers in history, Charles Spurgeon, he said he had two reasons why he was who he was, why he had greatness in his life. One was because of the truth of the message that he preached. The second was because of his mother. You know, mamas and daddies are important. I don't care how you slice it, parents are important in people's lives. They're important in children's lives. And, and, and it's one, of, they're, they're, they're great important. The father and the, the mother are incredibly important in the child. And, um, you know, Joshua, who was a great general, was also a great dad. And Joshua was such a great dad, Charles, he said this, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so he made sure that his kids knew the standard, that the standard would be God. But then you come to the baby, Jesus had a special place in his heart for his babies. He said that the Bible says, then the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them. He laid hands on them and he prayed for them. But the disciples rebuked him and they said, don't do that. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them <clears throat> for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hand on them and departed from there. What I have discovered is this, that the family is a divine institution ordained by God in the beginning of time. Before God established the church, he established the family. He established the family. We know the story began with Adam and Eve and their family. They didn't have a perfect family. If you read the story, you understand they didn't have a perfect family. You're not going to have a perfect family. This is not going to be a perfect family. And as pretty as she is right now, and as, as congenial as she is right now, She's not perfect, but she's not required to be. God doesn't require perfection from our children. And it's important for you as parents to recognize the obligation and responsibility to God in this matter. And, 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 and there's an obligation to the child, but an obligation to God. Moses' mother, she thought she could have such a great obligation that even though she gave her child away, she still got the privilege of training her child in the ways of God. And they go teaching that. The great mother Hannah in the Bible, she recognized that her child belonged to God and not to her. And that's what you need to realize is Laura is on loan to you. She doesn't belong to you. She's not your property. She's a baby that God has entrusted you with. And that's a great trust that God has given that you get to raise this child and raise this baby. And her son Samuel, his name meant that he was God asked. In other words, she asked God for him because she prayed and God granted her request. There are some mothers and fathers who are afraid to trust their children to God. But today, when you bring in this baby for dedication, that's what you're saying is we're going to trust Laura to God. Yeah, I get to be the parent. I'm going to raise her, but I'm going to trust God with helping me to do things for her. And I, don't, I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to trust God with this baby. You know, I want to ask you guys as parents a couple of statements before I get to take her. And then I want you to answer these by the, uh, the affirmative in we do or we will. Do you today recognize that this child, Laura, as a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessings for her? Do you now dedicate Laura, your child, to the Lord who gave her to you all, surrendering all worldly claims upon her life in the hope that she will belong wholly to God? Do you pledge as parents that with God's fatherly help, you will bring her up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the Word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into her life? Do you promise to provide through God's blessing for her physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs? Looking to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith for wisdom, love, strength, to serve, to serve Jesus and not just to use this baby, but to serve this baby as well. Do you promise that with God helping you to make it your regular prayer,
that by God's grace, your child will come to trust in Jesus Christ. You can't make her get saved, but you can keep her in a place where she has that opportunity to give her heart to the Lord. That understanding the God's forgiveness of sins in her life, and I promise you she's going to sin at some point in time. They're going to do it. I, 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 I can guarantee you that. But she can be forgiven. And the key is here, do you promise to raise her in the fear and admonition of the Lord by keeping her in a Bible-believing church? And Jackson has some wonderful Bible-believing churches. You all do? Now what I want to do, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you guys. Now Ron, before I do that, you're, you're her only grandparent that's here today. I know she's got other grandparents, but... but do you as a granddad promise to, to help set a godly example for her life? The Bible says that children's children are the crown of a man's old age. Now, I know you're younger than me, but by the fact that you've got this crown, that makes you an old man. How many of you agree with that, right? <laughs> All right. Ron always teases me I'm older than him. And he's a Cardinal fan too, but that's neither here nor there. Would you? <laughs> I'll go there. Would y'all stretch your hands and pray for this family right now as we pray over them together? Laura, together, we pray, dear Lord, for your parents. We pray, dear God, that your parents and your grandparents would help teach you and train you and provide for you. And to bless you, dear God, in the name of Jesus. We pray right now, dear Lord, that you would give them the wisdom and instruction and the love in their hearts to raise you the way you're supposed to be raised. To keep you in the house of God. To teach you the word of God. And to teach you the character of God in their lives. We pray that you would give them strength and wisdom during hard times and good times in their lives together. For this child and for their own souls. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I love this other part. Y'all have to take a step back. I get to take her. Now, she's been acting like she's going to be held for a little bit, all right? Look at this. My goodness. She's heavier than I expected. Now, look at that. Isn't she pretty? Isn't she pretty? She is pretty. Now, I want y'all to stretch your hands toward her. We're going to pray for her. And, um, and we're going to bless her. We're going to pray for her life and all the things in her life as we anoint this beautiful child with oil here. Would you stretch your hands this way? Heavenly Father, we pray right now for baby Laura. And God, we pray, dear Lord, that you would bless her, dear God. Lord, I pray for health for this beautiful child. I pray, dear God, that she would grow to know you and that, Lord, she would give her heart to you at the earliest age that she can. Lord, I pray for protection over her life, not just in her body, but in her family and other aspects, dear God. I pray that you would be with her. God, we thank you for this baby. And God, we give this baby to you today. Lord, we thank you. And we love you for this baby. And we love this baby in Jesus' name. Amen. They love the headset mics, these babies, and they want to grab a hold of them. Would y'all give her a hand clap? Isn't she just precious? I mean, she's done really good. And I'm going to give her back to you guys. We have something for her. We have her baby's first Bible. Now, she can't read it, but keep this for her. But read the Bible to her. And it says here, Laura Elizabeth Reagan. So we're just going to call her Laura Beth, all right? Is that okay? All right. And... And here's a certificate that they have, a certificate of dedication on this day, October 10, 2021. Would you give these guys a hand clap? Congratulations, Brother Ron. Great call. All right. Isn't God good? He is so good to us. And I thank God for, for His goodness on everything and every aspect of our lives. We're going to get into the message this morning as we move forward with our series on following God. And I, this message that I'm going to be sharing this morning, it's going to come from a different passage of Scripture that um, 
that I've never used in, in, in studying following God. In fact, the last time that I can think that I preached from this passage was in 2007 or 2008. I preached on Easter from this passage. I'm going to come to you out of Matthew chapter 7 in the beginning here. In Matthew chapter 7, it says this. And I think this is absolutely key for following God. It says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And God, as we get into this today, I pray, dear Lord, that you would bless it and speak to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When we talk about following God, and I think about following God, we oftentimes think about just that little that relationship that is so important and it is incredibly important. We think about the intimacy with God and that is incredibly important. But there's so much more to following God. You see, what I discover is I look at this scripture and the world would have us follow a broad path. A broad path that, in fact, the majority follows. There is seven and a half plus billion people on this world today. Two and a half billion claim to be Christians. The, the late evangelist Billy Graham used to say this. He said, one in five church attenders in America, sitting on church pews all over America, are lost. Signifying that 20% of the church attended population is lost. Now, when, when you begin to do those numbers and look at those numbers, what it begins to tell us that some 56 million people three years ago attended church in America today, it is significantly less because of COVID and different things. And, and so, but we're going to go back to those statistics where 56 million, 18% of the American population would be in church on a given Sunday. And if you do that and you go and you say one-fifth of that 56 million people, you're looking at some 11 million people in America that may be Christians. Now think about that for a moment, if statistics hold true. Now what that tells me is that even being in church doesn't make somebody a Christian, and it doesn't make them follow the narrow path. We should teach people to follow the narrow path. Because if we're going to follow God, we have to understand that it is not a broad path. It is not a path that is, that is wide. It is not a path that, 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 that any religion can follow. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about religion. There is only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What well, does that sound like a narrow way of thinking? It probably is a narrow way of thinking, but again, we're supposed to think narrow. That doesn't mean we stop loving other people. What that means is it is a, it is a narrow path. It, 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 it's not always an easy path, but it's a narrow path. You see, religion is man's attempt to make himself acceptable to God. But the narrow gate that leads to life is Jesus and He makes us acceptable. See, you can never make yourself acceptable, but when you go through the narrow path, that narrow gate, that's how you get acceptable. The only way to salvation is Jesus Christ. That way to salvation is not just becoming saved, but becoming a Christ follower. Again, I told you last week about the term Christian, which is only mentioned in three different places in the Bible. We throw the term Christian around as if it's a significant terminology when in reality that, that is a term that, that the only way it can become relevant in our life is if we become Christ followers. That if we follow Christ. You see, I know people who say they're Christian but they don't act like Christ. I can put a, I can put a sign on my vehicle and my, I can put the sign of the fish on my vehicle but that doesn't make me a Christian. I have, I have passed lots of people on the interstate with the, with, the, with the fish on their vehicle that didn't act Christian when somebody pulled in front of them or slowed down or they had road rage. I, 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 have, I have seen people that had, had on their cars follow me to church and, 
and they got treated and they treated people ugly in their car that didn't make them a Christ follower. And, then, and, and, and so my point is, being a Christian, being a Christ follower, it requires something different. It requires a narrow path. It doesn't speak this passage. In fact, this passage doesn't speak specifically about following. But it implies that if we want salvation, if we want eternal life, and that's what we want, right? Amen. If we want eternal life and the blessings that go with it, we must follow. And we have to follow the narrow path. And the only way to go down the narrow path is to follow Christ. Because he's walking that narrow path. You think about the walk that Jesus Christ had. He walked a walk that was completely different than anybody else had ever walked this earth. He walked one of purity, holiness. He walked one that, that, was, that was free from, from the lifestyle of the Pharisees. He walked one that was powerful and mighty. The true goal of our walk with God is does our life, now hear this, does our life resemble Jesus? I think it's perfect on a baby dedication. The goal is that, that you're going to be Christ followers and then this child follows you in that path. Does your life resemble Jesus so that that baby's life can resemble Jesus down the road? The reason the church in the 21st century doesn't look like the church in the 1st century in the day of Acts is because we haven't made it our goal. Oh, hear me. The church in the 21st century has not made it its goal to resemble Christ. Too often, we're trying to resemble other churches or other Christians. And it doesn't work if I'm trying to resemble other Christians or other churches or even try to resemble the world. As long as we are doing that, we aren't following God. We're following, but we're not following Him. And as we continue in this message series over these next few weeks, we want to discover what it's like, what it really means to follow. Think about the things that you would like to have happen in your life spiritually. And that's what I want you to think about. I want us to begin thinking eternally. I think about eternity and I think about all the people that over the years, I think about the Sanctuary Sunday School class and since 2010, Brother Jerry, how many of those I've preached their funerals or am going to preach one this week and, 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 I, and I think about those things and, and, and what, I, what I think about is this, when I, 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 when I go to a cemetery and finish a funeral. You know, I don't think, quite honestly, no, I want you to understand this. Please don't misunderstand me. I, under, I, I understand the importance of it, but I don't think necessarily when we, when somebody is put in a casket and we lay them in a grave and we pre preach their funeral, I don't think necessarily about them being in that grave. Why? Because I am thinking eternally. You see, I'm thinking eternally. I'm thinking that Sister Nell, who her body may go into that casket, her body may go in that grave, but she's not there, folks. That the moment that she passed away around 11 o'clock on, 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 on Wednesday, that the moment she passed and she went to sleep on this earth, she woke up in the presence of the Lord because the Bible says to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. See, I think about that. I think about that. And I think about that more. Why? Because that's the goal, is eternal life. And as a Christ follower, that's what I want to follow Him for, is eternity. And so I want you to think for a few moments today about what do you want spiritually? What do you want in your personal life? And what do you want in your family life? Because if it is not eternal life, you've missed it. And we're following the wrong direction. Last week we talked about being a Christ follower somewhat. I sent some texts out to some people asking what they thought it meant to be a Christ follower. And I, I was given this term. And, and then I had to sit back and think about it. And I went and studied and I went and found the author of this term. And how many of you ever saw the show that was on TV years ago called The Apprentice? Anybody ever saw The Apprentice? The Apprentice 
was a show that was done that described that, that, that had people coming. They they, tr they, they they would try to 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 to, to build uh, had start businesses and so forth. They had apprenticeships and so forth. And as a, a Christ follower, this is what we are. When you are a Christ follower, you are an apprentice. Now think about it. You're an apprentice. What is an apprentice? An, an apprentice when it comes to being a Christ follower. Here's what an apprentice for a Christ follower is. It's somebody learning and living the way of Jesus. Now here's what we're going to look at. If I'm going to be an apprentice learning and living the way of Jesus, what I find is this. My apprenticeship doesn't stop when I get to a certain age. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. If you are a Christ follower, you're an apprentice until you get to eternity. What does that mean? That means every day I'm learning and living the way of Jesus. Some days are better than the others. Some days are more of a challenge than others. But every day I am an apprentice. Well, you're a pastor. You should know everything. No, I don't. I remember several years ago, Governor Mike Huckabee was running for the presidency of the United States, and they asked Governor Huckabee, they said, they said, you're a Baptist preacher. Surely you know all there is to know about God. Would you tell us? And, and this is his response to that. He says, if I know all there is to know about God, I'm going to have to get me a bigger God. What did that tell me? It told me this, that I'm always living and learning the way of Jesus. I'm always in that learning mode. You see, that, that, that's one of the issues. If we're going to be followers of Christ, we've got to continually grow. I can't just read through the Word once. I've got to continually read through the Word. I haven't mastered the 31,000 verses in this Bible yet. I haven't mastered my relationship with God yet. It is a work in progress. I am a work in progress. And I'm going to be perfectly honest about, you, about this to, to you guys. Sometimes I am moving forward at a breakneck speed. And I feel like I'm growing spiritual at a great, breakneck speed. And then sometimes I take a few steps back. I'm taking plenty of steps back in my walk with God. I, I, it's not always it's, it's, it's not always one of those things where, where, where I'm perfectly moving forward. Sometimes I take some step back. Sometimes I fall and I trip up on things in life. But that's what an apprenticeship is about. I think of somebody being an apprentice in their work. And what is an apprentice in their work? Is somebody trying to learn how to do something in their life. Somebody trying to learn how to do something new. If somebody's going to be a plumber and they're going to learn to be a plumber, they're going to have to be an apprentice and study under a, a, another plumber that knows what they're doing. If they're going to be an electrician, they're going to have to be an apprentice and study under somebody that knows how to do it. Now, let me, if, if you want to be an electrician and you want to learn how to be an electrician, you want to make a good living to be an electrician, are you going to go to Bible seminary to learn to be an electrician? Of course not. My dad, my dad went to college. He went to college for a short time. He went to Purdue University when they lived up in Indiana. And my dad decided, Brother Bubba, that he was going to be an electrician. And my dad went and, 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 and he did all the stuff. And, 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 and he got his electrician's license. Went back in the 60s at Purdue University in Indiana. And, 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 he, and he got his electrician's license. Now, if anybody knew my dad, Brother Bobby, my dad wasn't an electrician. He was a car salesman and a farmer. My dad tried to wire some stuff, and it just didn't work out right. I mean, in fact, when we had problems in our house, we wouldn't let Dad change out a receptacle. We would have to get somebody that knew what they were. My dad had an electrician's license. But his problem was, my dad would not allow himself to go in an apprenticeship. He didn't want to be trained by anybody. My dad did not like having a boss. He did not like having anybody over him. He did not like anybody telling him what to do. And because of that, he had to give up electrician work and he became a car salesman. And, and, and he, became, he became that. And then, but he even became somebody that taught other car salesmen how to do. One of the great testimonies I ever heard about my dad as a car salesman, even though he was a lousy electrician, he was a really good car salesman. Sister Alice Watson's oldest son 
He started selling cars in 1980 at Old Langley Dodge, and he learned to sell cars from my dad. And he's been selling cars all over the Mid-South ever since. Oh, he, he, he left the small dealerships of Blyville and went to work in the big dealerships of Memphis and, 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 and did really well. He told me of how he learned to, to sell cars from my dad, and I didn't even know that until I met him. And, 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 and he, so he kind of had an apprenticeship. He said, he taught me lots of things to do and lots of things what not to do. And that's what an apprentice is. They learn things to do and things not to do. And if we're an apprentice of Christ, isn't that what He does? Is He teaches us what to do and what not to do. And now here's the problem. The Bible tells us this. There's a way that appears right to man, but those ways end in death. They end in destruction. And so we need to understand that not everything we do is correct and right. And so I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures as we, as we try to get into this. This past Wednesday, we talked about Psalm 23. And when I thought about following, I couldn't help but think about Psalm 23. At the very beginning of Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I like nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me. Everybody say leads me. He leads me beside the still waters. You know what I find about God? If I'm going to be an apprentice of God, if I'm going to be a follower of God, God gives me a path to follow. God gives us a path to follow. I mean, it wouldn't be much of following, and he wouldn't be much of a leader if he didn't give us a path, would he? But he's given us a path. The Bible says there are several things we need to do to receive guidance from God. And the first thing is this. We need a path. I can't receive guidance if I don't have a path. And the Bible says, here he says, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness. The Bible says that, that he leads me beside the still waters. You know, you understand, that's what God does. I need to admit in my life, if I'm going to be a follower, I need to admit that I need somebody to follow. I can't do it on my own. I need a guide. I need that guide to get me where I need to be. Now Isaiah said this, all of us are like sheep. We've strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. I watched a video the other day of a, of a sheep in Australia. Australia has a lot of sheep in the outback. And there was a sheep that, what happens is, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but sheep have to be sheared or their wool will overwhelm them. And there was a sheep that had gotten out the path. And this particular sheep had gotten off the path and for five plus years, Brother Doyle, this sheep had not been sheared. And, I, and they showed a video of the sheep. And it had, it blows my mind, somewhere like 40 kilograms of wool on it. You couldn't even, now that doesn't sound like much. Folks, that's almost a hundred pounds of wool. The wool had gotten over its face. It couldn't see. It had seen what, what, what happened to that sheep. That sheep that had not been sheared, it lost the ability to see. It lost the ability to find its own food. It had gotten off the path and it messed up. It didn't have anything to follow. And that's what Isaiah said here. He said, he said we're like sheep. Sometimes we stray and when we stray, we put ourselves in there. And, and, and thankfully, somebody, they found the sheep, brought it in, and then they sheared the sheep. And now that sheep is on its, on, on its good standing and, and learning how to live and learning how to walk again. That sheep couldn't even walk because of the extra weight and the malnutrition. Most of the time, we don't want to follow God or anybody else because we love to do our own thing. But folks, I want to submit myself to not doing my own thing. I'm tired of my own thing. My own thing only gets me in trouble. My, only thing, my own thing only hurts me. I want Him to guide me in the path of righteousness. God made you so you would not be able to see the future no matter how much you pray, no matter how much, no matter how much that you, you, you know spiritually that you can't see the future. As much as we, we, we can read and understand Bible prophecy, but we can't see the future only God can see the future. That's why I need to follow Him. Why do I need to follow Him? Because I follow Him to depend on Him. 
We all need somebody to follow. We all need the path to follow. But here's where God lays it on us. This is where he lays it on you and me. I have to decide to follow. You remember when, when right now, when, when that baby is small, mom and daddy's going to take her hands and make her go certain places. There's going to be a time, guys, let me just tell you, there's going to be a time where she wants to go her own way. Now, at certain levels, at certain ages, you've got to still, got to still keep getting guidance. Isn't that true? I mean, you never stop being a parent. You've got to keep giving guidance, and you can give guidance, but you can never make them follow once they get to a certain age. You know whose decision it is that they follow? It's their decision to follow. You know, when, 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 when I got to be a certain age, I couldn't just go to church because my mom made me. I couldn't just be saved because mom made me. I had to make a decision myself. You see, I grew up, I was raised in church, and I remember mom and dad making me, and I'm glad, I thank God for parents who make their kids. But then there came a time when I was 19 years old, and I was still going to church, but I wasn't made to follow God. And in that altar, when that preacher gave the altar call, and he talked about I could either follow the world or I could follow God, then I decided then to follow God myself. God will never force you to follow Him. He's never going to force you. He does require it, though. Now, He may not force you to do it, but He requires it for us to make it to heaven. He requires it for us to make it to eternity. How do I know that? Let's go back to the scripture that we started with. Enter by the narrow gate, not the wide gate. You see, I have discovered this some paths in in destruction and will keep us off track. That's why we need to admit this. Everybody needs this. God, I need help. God, I need to follow. But ultimately, you know what following means is this. Mimicking. Imitating. Copying. One of my favorite things when Katie Beth was a little baby she went with me everywhere. Some would say, oh, you shouldn't have made your kid go to those places, but um, we, didn't have, we didn't have a full-time babysitter, and so I would carry her with me to hospitals. I would carry her with me to nursing homes. I would carry her with me into some bad situations. And, and so she was about three years old, and me and her had gone to, uh, to church at, a, at one of our friends' churches in Mark Tree to, to, to a revival service or something like that. And, 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 and she had gone with me, and, and I, was, I was toting her around, and I was carrying her. You know, she's, she's two and a half, three years old, and, 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 and we're at church. And, 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 I, and at the, after church was over, there was a woman in church needing prayer. We're in, the, we're in the aisle of the church, and she's just a little baby. And all she knows to do is what daddy does. And this woman needs prayer. And we walk over to there to her. And I walk over and I lay my hands on this woman and begin to pray for this woman. One of the men from my church in Marion was with me. And, 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 and he was behind me praying for this woman that wanted prayer. And you know what, what that, little, that little kid did? And, 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 and she, she's, she's three years old. So I, I had my hand laid on her. She slaps her hand on that woman's head. She lays on that woman's head and she goes... La, 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 sha, la, 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 you know. Well, she wasn't in the Holy Spirit. She had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. She was two or three years old. She didn't know that. You know what she was doing? She was mimicking. She was, she was imitating. She was copying. But she was praying sincerely for that woman. And I remember Brother Charles Hogue, who was with me at that time at that service, and I got the privilege of preaching his funeral about six years ago. I remember Brother Hogue, Tell me every time that, I, that he said, I'll always remember that child mimicking you. And she didn't hesitate to lay hands on folks. And it was a powerful thing. What was it? She had seen somebody that she loves doing something. And what did she want to do? She wanted to mimic. Here it is. We love Jesus, right? We see the things Jesus did. We see the mind that he had. 
In 1 Corinthians 2 it says, Who has known the mind of the Lord that He may instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Listen, my friends. If we're going to be apprentices, we've got to mimic Jesus. We are copies of Him. That's what following is. We're copies of Him. To follow Jesus is to apprentice under Him as He's the master teacher. It's a life organized around three very simple things. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what He did. That's what it means. We want to be with Him, we want to become like Him, and we want to do what He did. And here's what I find. This comes to music. Here's how I want to mimic Jesus. I want to mimic Jesus in these ways. I want you to learn to mimic Jesus in these ways. Reach out to others. There's a, we are living in a world in desperate need. And the only one that can meet that need is Jesus. I thank God for community programs. I thank God for stepping out in the community. But folks, hear me. The church, the people of God have to reach out. We're going to have to be the one that show the kindness, the compassion to others. We want to strive to live right. Everybody say to live right. There's a righteous way that He's called us to. He's not called us to perfection, but He has called us to righteousness. There's a compassionate way. God's people have got to be the most compassionate people on the planet. I'm not talking about us being compassionate to each other. That's easy. It's easy for you to be compassionate to one another. That's easy. That's, that's not hard. I'm talking about we've got to be compassionate to a world out there that's dying and going to hell. God's people. We've got to be the most compassionate people. We've got to be the most loving people. But you know what happens? When we're mimicking Jesus, we also can copy in His power. We can operate in His power. You know, the disciples would get aggravated when they saw other people operating in Jesus' power. They'd say, oh, they, 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 they're not been around us. You know what they were doing? They were operating. He says, listen, if they're for me, they're with me. And that's what he's saying. We've got to walk in faith. We've got to help me to calm in the storms. We gotta move mountains with faith. We gotta look to bring others to Him. We've got to live exemplary life. I think about it. We as Christians, we've got to be the people who are the faith builders in this world. I, I wonder, I, I've got to ask you, do you still believe that God can do mighty things by faith? As a copier of Jesus, as an apprentice of Him, you have authority to mimic Him in those ways. Do you still believe that God can move mountains? Who believes that God can heal cancer? Who believes that God can, 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 can heal diabetes? Who believes that God can heal heart disease? Who believes that God can, can still move mountains in people's lives? Who believes that God can turn family situations around? That God can take you and that He can, that he can turn around lives? That God can take your child that's a prodigal and turn your child around and save their soul and change their life? Who still believes those things? He said, that's what people of faith, because we're mimicking and believing Jesus, we can see those mighty things happen. I love what Proverbs 4 says. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining bright till the full light of day. Did you hear that? If we are apprentices or followers of Christ, that's what we're going to be. Here's what it is. This is what I desire. I desire to walk this narrow path. I, I, I want to walk that narrow path that, that just takes me where He wants me to go. Not that bright, bright, bright that, that, that white path. You know, it, it, yeah, it's easier to go the white path because the white path is easy. You're not, you, you're, you're not going to necessarily bump into the shoulder. You're not going to bump in. You, 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 but you go the narrow path. So you, you want to with the 
narrow path requires, it requires you to walk straighter. It requires you to walk different. It requires you to walk in a way that, 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 that leaves no doubt. But the white path says, you know, I can be all over the place. And we can't. We can't. But he tells us this. I mean, this is the power of this word. I mean, he says, if you walk that narrow path, that, that path of righteousness, he said, it's going to be like the first gleam of dawn. How many of you know what the first gleam of dawn looks like? Now, you got to get up early to see the first gleam of dawn, but it can be beautiful, can't it? And he says, shining brighter till the full light of day. The people who walk the path of God and follow him are going to shine. Isaiah said it this way, arise and shine. We are to be more than Christians. We're to be Christ followers. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask your God that you let it just saturate in our lives. God, saturate in our homes, saturate in our families. We want to be followers of you more than anything. Thank you, Lord. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I mentioned to you just a few moments ago that we can mimic him. And I, I, I want to ask you, maybe you're in need of something. And see, I believe Christ's followers can help with this. Maybe you've got a a bit of a, a storm in your life. It's not a problem to have a storm. There's nothing wrong with you having storms in your life. I have them all the time. And you have a storm in your life, but because you're a Christ follower, you can bring calm to the storm because you're mimicking him. Or, or, or maybe you know somebody that has a storm. And because you're a Christ follower, you can help bring calm to it. Who in here would say, Pastor, I've got a storm in my life. I need it to be calm. Hold your hand up. Be honest. Nobody looking around. Hold your hand up. Say, I've got a storm in my life. Hold it up. Would you stand to your feet? You got your hand raised? Stand to your feet. Don't you be afraid that you've got a storm. You, you, you in here and you say, Pastor, I, I love what Jesus tells us. That if we have faith the size of, the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. There's some people in here that have some mountains in their lives. And as a Christ follower, you can move mountains. But you say, I've got a mountain in my life. My mountain's a mountain of sickness. My mountain is a health mountain. I, 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 I'm dealing with health issues. I never thought I would deal with them. I need to move that mountain. If that's you, hold your hand up. Say, I, I, I need a healing in my body. Hold it up. Say, I need God to give me a miracle. Hold your hand up. There's some of you that you know somebody else that's got this mountain in their body. You say, man, I know somebody that's got a mountain. How many of you know somebody that's got a mountain in front of them that they don't know how they're going to get through it? Hold your hand up. Do you have the faith to help them? Can, can you have the faith as a Christ follower to help them? Absolutely you can. God doesn't require you to have to call and tell the pastor to do it. You're a Christ follower. You have the authority to move that mountain in their life. If you raise your hand saying you know somebody that's got a mountain, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand to your feet. I, I want to see the faith that you've got to move mountains because you can move them. You can help other people move. There's other things. There's so much stuff. I want to be a Christ follower of my walk. But I understand living right's not always easy. I understand it's not always easy. I understand it's a challenge. Look at me. Everybody look at me for just a moment. It's a challenge for me to live right. Because my flesh says don't. I have to consciously in the morning get up and and i got to sacrifice my flesh daily. Because I want to do just as much stuff as the rest of the world. But, but being a Christ follower says, walk the straight path. Walk the narrow path. You see, I, 
I really want more to go to heaven than I want the world. If you struggle with those things in your life, in just a minute, we're going to pray in this altar. How many of you believe that God can do some transformation and change in the altar? I believe that. Those of you that are standing, I want you to come and stand in this altar right now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray in just a moment. And I believe that God is going to do some things. I believe that God is going to do some things. I believe that God is going to help some Christ followers. I believe that God is going to help some apprentices to see some amazing things. Heavenly Father, right now as we get ready to pray, we turn everything over to you. And we ask you, dear God, to speak in the people's lives. In Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet right now? Would you stretch your hands towards some people in the name of Jesus?